please have a seat. That was uh, a really warm welcome. I am impressed that here at Kansas State, after the school year is out, on a Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, you're able to fill this auditorium. That's really remarkable. Thank you for the wonderful invitation to be here. Um, I too want to acknowledge uh, the distinguished visitors, uh, the distinguished public officials here, most of all Senator Pat Roberts, who has been a stalwart champion for the state of Kansas and for national security and homeland security. Thank you for your service, sir. I also want to acknowledge the members of the United States Army who are here um, from Fort Riley and other places. I was chatting with a few of them before uh, my remarks here today. Um, members of the Army, please stand and, and of the Armed Forces, please stand and be recognized. I'm proud of the fact that in the Department of Homeland Security, we've got so many uh, veterans of our armed forces, uh, two of whom are with me here today. They are two of my public affairs officers, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tanya Bradshaw and retired Lieutenant Colonel Todd Brazil. Please stand. Stand up. Uh, where's Todd? Todd is, now, I gotta talk a little bit about Todd. Uh, Todd is dressed in blue jeans today. Um, there is life after the United States Army in civilian clothes. Uh, Todd is dressed in blue jeans. Uh, the reason he's blessed, dressed in blue jeans today is because he has a really nice suit that is somewhere in checked luggage between O'Hare and Kansas City. <laughs> he would want you to know that. Again, thank you for the invitation to, to be here. I am truly impressed with the list of those who have preceded me in this lecture series to include Presidents Carter and Reagan, both Presidents Bush, Vice President Mondale, Tom Donlin, Nelson Rockefeller. I just finished reading Richard Norton Smith's book about Nelson Rockefeller. My former boss and Kansan, Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, Colin Powell, Leslie Stahl, Bob Dole, Robert and Ted Kennedy, Pat Moynihan, and Barry Goldwater, and Shirley Temple, and Alf Landon. <laughs> I've got to tell a story. Senator Roberts will appreciate this story. 1978, I was a summer intern for the United States Senate. I was 20 years old, a uh, rising senior in college. I was working for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan my senator from New York. And um, one day, I was with his driver in the Dirksen Senate office building during the summer of 1978, and his driver said to me, Jay, let's take a ride on the senator's only elevator. They're gone, they're not around, they're in recess. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> yes, I am positive, they are gone. Moynihan is nowhere near. So we walked up to the elevator, we pushed the button, I'm standing there, the door is open, and in front of me is Barry Goldwater. <laughs> nose to nose with Barry Goldwater, and I swear to goodness, he looked straight at me without batting an eye and said, hello, Senator, he just kept right on walking. <laughs> anyway, it's an honor for me to join this long distinguished list of past lecturers here. I believe I'm the first Secretary of Homeland Security to do so. Formed by Congress in 2002 in the wake of 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security is the third largest department of the United States government. It has a total annual spending authority of about 60 billion, 225,000 people and 22 components. I find it interesting in my introductions around the country, people find it more remarkable that I used to lead 10,000 lawyers as opposed to 225,000 people now. <laughs> Our responsibilities include counterterrorism, border security, port security, aviation security, maritime security, cybersecurity, the administration 
and enforcement of our immigration laws, the detection of nuclear, chemical, and biological threats to our homeland, the protection of our critical infrastructure, the protection of our national leaders, and the response to natural disasters, such as floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. DHS includes within it customs and border protection, immigration and customs enforcement, citizenship and immigration services, TSA, FEMA, the Federal Protective Service, the Secret Service, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and the United States Coast Guard. In about two hours, I will participate, as you heard, in the groundbreaking ceremony here for our National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, which will help protect our nation's food supply and public health. We have many missions in the Department of Homeland Security, but they all fall within our broader overarching mission, the protection of our homeland. In my view, counterterrorism must remain the cornerstone of our department's overall homeland security mission. It's the reason the department was created by Congress in the wake of 9-11. Also, I'm a New Yorker, and I was present on Manhattan Island on September 11th, which happens to also be my birthday. I am therefore an eyewitness to an act of terrorism that can shatter a beautiful and ordinary workday in an instant and cause what was up till then unimaginable horror and tragedy. Out of that day, the Department of Homeland Security was born, and my personal commitment to the mission of Homeland Security was born. Today, almost 14 years after 9-11, it is still a dangerous world. And there is a new reality to the global terrorist threat. I'd like to discuss that new reality today and what we are doing about it. Not that long ago, the terrorist threat to the United States from Al-Qaeda was trained and directed overseas and exported to our homeland. The 9-11 hijackers were acting on orders from Al-Qaeda's external operations chief, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was in turn carrying out the direction of Osama bin Laden. Likewise, the attempted shoe bomber in December 2001, the attempted underwear bomber in December 2009, the attempted Times Square car bombing in May 2010, and the attempted package bomb plot in October 2010 were all efforts to export terrorism to the United States, and they all appear to have been directed by a terrorist organization overseas. The response to these types of attacks and attempted attacks on our homeland was and is to take the fight directly to the terrorist organizations at locations overseas. And as a result of these operations, many of the leaders of Al-Qaeda are now dead or captured. Osama bin Laden is dead. Anwar Awlaki, one of the leaders of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is dead. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed awaits trial before a military commission. But the new reality is that the global terrorist threat is more decentralized, more complex, and in many respects, harder to detect. The new reality involves the potential for smaller scale attacks by those who are either homegrown or home-based, not exported, and who are inspired by, not necessarily directed by, a terrorist organization. Today, it is no longer necessary for terrorist organizations to personally recruit, train, and direct operatives overseas and in secret and export them to the U.S. to commit a terrorist attack. Today, with new and skilled use of the Internet, terrorist organizations may publicly recruit and inspire individuals to conduct attacks within their own homelands. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula no longer builds bombs in secret. It publicizes its instruction manual in its magazine and publicly urges people to use it. Today, we are also concerned about the so-called foreign fighter, those who are answering public calls to leave their home countries in Europe and elsewhere to travel to Iraq and Syria and take up the extremist fight there. Many of these individuals will seek to return to their home countries with the same extremist motive. The recent wave of terrorist attacks 
and attempted attacks here and in Europe reflect this new reality. The Boston Marathon bombing in April 2013, the attack on the War Memorial in the Parliament Building in Ottawa in October 2014, the attack on the Charlie Hebdo headquarters in Paris in January 2015, and the attempted terrorist attack in Garland City, Texas in May 2015. What do these recent wave of attacks and attempted attacks have in common? They were all conducted by homegrown or home-based actors, and they all appear to have been inspired but not directed by Al-Qaeda or ISIL. So what are we doing about it? First, we continue to take the fight to terrorist organizations overseas. ISIL is the terrorist organization most prominent on the world stage now. Since last summer, September, our airstrikes and special operations have in fact led to the death of a number of ISIL's leaders. As President Obama indicated the other day, though there are tactical setbacks from time to time, we know that through sustained continued support of the Iraqi government and its security forces and with the international coalition, we will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. We also continue counterterrorism operation, operations against Al-Qaeda targets in Yemen and elsewhere. We will continue to hunt for and take the fight directly to the terrorist organizations who threaten the United States at the places where they hide, where they plan, and where they train. Our intelligence community, particularly since 9-11, will continue to detect terrorist plots overseas at their earliest stages. Much of the terrorist threat continues to evolve around aviation security. We continuously evaluate, modify, and enhance our aviation security measures to stay one step ahead of what we believe the bad guys may be plotting. Last summer, for example, I directed enhanced screening at select overseas airports with direct flights to the United States. Weeks later, we added other airports, the United States, the United Kingdom rather, and other countries followed suit with similar enhancements. In January, TSA also increased random searches of passengers and carry-on luggage at U.S. airports. Last month, I directed enhancements to close certain vulnerabilities in airport security around the nation. We are building more pre-clearance operations at foreign airports with direct flights into the United States. This means deploying our customs officials overseas to screen passengers bound for the U.S. at the front end of a flight before they arrive in the United States. We now have 15 pre-clearance operations and we are building more. The most recent pre-clearance operation was set up early last year in Abu Dhabi. Since that time, in Abu Dhabi alone, we have already screened more than 500,000 passengers and crew bound for the United States and have denied boarding to 785 individuals, including a number who were found in the terrorist screening database. Since 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security has become much more sophisticated at identifying individuals of suspicion who seek to travel to the United States. We continue to strengthen these systems with our own law enforcement and intelligence community and with our friends and allies overseas. At present, there are 38 countries for which we do not require a visa from its tourist travelers who seek to come to the United States. Our visa waiver program is a valuable tool for international commerce and travel. It must continue in a secure manner. Thus, we have determined that there are security enhancements that can be made to that program. Last year, DHS added more data fields to the electronic system for travel authorization, known as ESTA, to learn more key biographic information about travelers from visa waiver countries before they board an aircraft bound for the United States. Already, we have seen that these changes are providing added benefits to our security. We have identified a number of other security enhancements that can be made to the visa waiver program, which I expect to announce soon. 
The goal is to know more about those who travel to the United States and to conduct even more effective security screening. We are encouraging countries in the visa waiver program to engage in more effective security and law enforcement cooperation with the United States. DHS is sharing our aviation screening expertise with our allies to help them identify illicit travel while also protecting the privacy and civil liberties of all travelers. Two days from now, I will represent the United States at an unprecedented session of the United Nations Security Council, along with my foreign counterparts represented on the Security Council, to discuss the problem of foreign fighters. We will track progress since the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 2178 on foreign fighters last September, and in general, discuss how we can do a better job individually and collectively to track and prevent foreign fighters. The FBI continues to identify, investigate, interdict, and help the Department of Justice prosecute attempted terrorist plots to the homeland. With the help of DHS, the FBI has also made a number of arrests of those who would attempt to become foreign fighters before they can get on an airplane and leave our country. In reaction to terrorist groups' public calls for attacks on government installations in the West and following the attack last fall in Ottawa, I directed that our Federal Protective Service enhance its security and presence at federal office buildings around the country. This enhanced security remains in place. In reaction to terrorist public calls for attacks on U.S. military installations and personnel, the Department of Defense has enhanced its security at bases in the United States. Given the new reality of the global terrorist threat, which involves the potential for small-scale homegrown attacks by those who could strike with little or no notice, we are working in closer collaboration with state and local law enforcement. Given the nature of the evolving threat, the local cop on the beat may actually be the first to detect a terrorist attack on the homeland. So as often as several times a week, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI share terrorist threat information and intelligence with joint terrorism task forces, state fusion centers, and local police chiefs and sheriffs. Several weeks ago, FBI Director Comey and I personally participated in a conference call with over 1,000 officers, officials of federal, state, and local law enforcement to personally communicate what we are seeing. With the FBI, DHS routinely prepares and releases written joint intelligence bulletins, or JIBs, that's the acronym, to inform state and local law enforcement about potential threats to the homeland. Prior to the attempted attack at Garland, we issued a jib about the risk of an attack there, given the nature of the exhibit. Fortunately, federal and local law enforcement were there, alert and prepared. Last September, DHS released a guide to help retail businesses identify suspicious, suspicious purchases of explosive precursors. We're promoting mobile phone applications to support local law enforcement and first responders. Our DHS Office of Infrastructure Protection, together with the FBI and the National Counterterrorism Center, are engaged in a multi-city campaign with commercial businesses to review and enhance their security plans. Next, given the evolving nature of the homegrown terrorist threat, I and other government officials have engaged in community outreach to counter violent extremism here at home. In my view, this is indispensable to our homeland security efforts. We must reach communities that themselves have the ability to reach those individuals who may succumb to the slick internet appeal of ISIL and turn to violence. So in 2014 alone, DHS held over 70 meetings, roundtables, and other events in 14 cities. I personally participate in these me meetings. Since becoming secretary, I have met with community leaders in Chicago, Columbus, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Boston, 
New York and Brooklyn. In a few weeks, I'll travel to Houston for the same purpose. The new reality is that our homeland security efforts must involve the public at large, too. In government, we're often afraid to ask the public for help. But we do need your help. At the Super Bowl earlier this year, we refashioned our If You See Something, Say Something campaign with a new look. This must be more than a slogan. We also need the help of Congress. We need a partner in Congress. Three months ago, frankly, it was counterproductive and unnecessary for the Congress to bring the 225,000 person Department of Homeland Security to the brink of government shutdown while failing to enact a full year appropriation for Homeland Security until five months into the fiscal year. It is alarming, and I'm sure Senator Roberts would agree with me, that just four and a half days from now, the legal authorization for activities critical to national security, law enforcement, and public safety will expire, and Congress has failed to enact anything in its place. On May 13th, the House passed the USA Freedom Act by a strong bipartisan margin of 338 to 88. The USA Freedom Act is a good bill. It strikes the right balance between civil liberties and national security. It prohibits the controversial practice of bulk data collection and maintains authorities for more targeted collection activities. But the Senate has failed to pass this reasonable compromise or any other legislation in place of the authorities that are about to expire at midnight on Sunday. The Senate, I hope, will act soon. Doing nothing, as I'm sure Senator Roberts would agree with me, is not a responsible option. Finally, it is distressing that Congress has failed to repeal sequestration. Four years ago, both Republicans and Democrats bet they could force compromise on taxes and spending by threatening themselves with a draconian slash and burn 1.2 trillion spending cut that would automatically kick in over a decade if Congress failed to act. But Congress failed to act and sequestration became the budget law of the land in 2011. In 2013, the Murray-Ryan budget deal gave us a reprieve from sequestration for two years, but it is scheduled to return again at the end of this fiscal year unless Congress acts to repeal it. Unless sequestration is repealed, Homeland Security funding will return to its lowest level adjusted for inflation in a decade. Sequestration is not smart government bu budget making. Sequestration was meant to be draconian and so ugly that Congress would do the right thing to prevent it. The Department of Homeland Security's proposed budget for fiscal year 2016 is $41.2 billion, which is $1.5 billion more than our current appropriation. This is a good budget request, which has been well received by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Sequestration would cut the department's spending power by nearly $1.9 billion and could force the department to cut frontline personnel, technology, grants to state and local governments, and infrastructure investment. Sequestration would mean halting our investment in new border security surveillance and equipment. Sequestration could mean that the Secret Service will lose $236 million or 12% of its budget at a time when it needs to upgrade security at the White House, hire more agents, and protect the 2016 candidates for president. Sequestration could mean that FEMA will see its pre-disaster mitigation grants reduced by 175 million, an 88% decrease, decrease to the program. This is money used to support faster recovery time from disasters and build more to bi and build more levees, strengthen levees, boardwalks, hospitals, and schools. Plain and simple, sequestration weakens our homeland security, and it makes no sense. Like President Obama and many of our Democratic and Republican congressional leaders, I urge Congress to repeal sequestration. One last point. 
which I repeat often. We know that in a free society, homeland security means striking a balance, a balance between basic physical security and our values as a nation of people who enjoy the freedom to travel and associate, cherish privacy, celebrate our diversity, and are not afraid. Terrorism cannot prevail if the people refuse to be terrorized. In the final analysis, these are the things that constitute our greatest homeland security and our greatest strength as a nation. Thank you for listening to me.